thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here with so many long-term colleagues and friends. Um, I've, been at, I've been given 10 minutes to tell you all about the housing options that exist in Arlington County for older people, all about the service options that exist, and tell you about one program, the Vertical Village. So I'll talk fast. Um, we have five different buildings that are for, for what's called independent older adults. And we have three assisted living programs that have 503 beds, because that's what it's called. You will find over there a page that lists all the independent housing, all the assisted living, and all the nursing homes, as well as the one, what they call a continuing care retirement community look-alike, which is just next door, the Jefferson. And to get a real feel for all the housing and actually service options that are available in the metropolitan area for people who live in this area, you would um, you'd be able to pick up a guide like this. And this site at the bottom gives you both the website and the phone number to call. Because people who are looking for housing or for services and are paying for themselves can find um, a variety of ways of doing that. Services. Um, number one, for all residents, there is a vibrant private sector array of services. And actually, we are lucky in this metropolitan area. We have far more than people in other areas. We have home care services, uh, elder law, geriatric care managers that help people access services. We have public services, star transportation, metro access the Office of Senior Adult Programs, those are available to people of all income levels. For low income, if you can go through the Department of Human Services, the Division of Aging and Disability Services, and their partner nonprofits, again, have a wide variety of programs. And once again, there is a sheet that you can pick up here that will list all of them. And then a document that we call Hidden Treasures that help people stay at home, and they're things that nobody knows about. It includes the real estate tax relief program that was mentioned earlier. There was an elder readiness task force appointed by the county board in 2006 to look at what were the issues that still remained and how could the, what could the county do in order to be prepared for a dramatically growing older population, and we look towards 2030. Obviously, had we known that 19% of the population was going to be 65 in 2020, we might have moved up our timeline. But I don't think it would have changed what the recommendations that the task force came up would have been. One of the things that was really clear, and it came to a note to this group, is that we have a significant number of service units for people who are very low income. And by low income in that context, I mean either below 50% of AMI so that they're eligible for HUD buildings, or below 60% of AMI so they're eligible for the tax credit buildings. We have two tax credit and three HUD buildings. And we have a variety of housing options for people who have very high income, Sunrise Emeritus, the Jefferson. And as you put it together in a chart, you have low income, you have high income, and zero units for middle and moderate income people. So we said, what might we do to, to address this issue? And we said, aha, people are living in apartments because we, we were not, because supportive services were available to single family homes, and you'll hear from the next panelist about the Arlington Villages, which is a wonderful model, we're looking at apartments, which is why we called it a vertical village. What might you do to help people there? You want to find a community setting where there is mass transit, it's walkable, it's near shopping, and there is a sufficient number of older people to really make it an effective program looked at building requirements. And the Commission on Aging went out and interviewed a lot of buildings in this area. And they said, we need to have a building that's well maintained. It's an elevator building, because as mentioned, one of the first things people can't do is use the stairs. 
some sort of resident manager support to make people uh, supportive of a program in the building, the availability of a community room for gets together and space for the program manager to use as an office with an access to office equipment and space for the coordinator to meet with residents. The whole purpose of this program was how do we help people stay in the apartment that they're in or for those people who are interested in moving out of their single family home and want to move to an apartment to be in a place with community and easy access to services. So the role of the program manager is to provide outreach to the residents, to promote community and develop some programs, to talk to the residents and identify needs. People have worked with most older adults. They don't have any problems. They don't need any services. Everything is fine until nothing is fine. So the idea was if you have somebody there and you're talking to just, let me talk to Eddie. He could help. He could tell me what I could do. He's a friend. He's a building. I know him. I see him. So that's the, that's the purpose there. And that person would then make referral to private and public services as needed. We did a lot of modeling of this based on the supportive services coordinators in the buildings for um, low-income folks, both for older people and for people of any age. We called the program a vertical village, and we had the program jointly paid for by Arlington County and Volunteers of America from January 2002 to June 2014, and those, those are the data I have. Volunteers of America is continuing the program, but I have data till through June 30th. It's hosted at Wildwood Park on Columbia Pike. For those of you who know the area, it is the last apartment building in Arlington County as you head west. It has 400 one to three bedroom units. The current rents are 1400 to 2625, and that makes it what we in Arlington call market rate affordable. That rent is affordable to people whose income is between 60 and 80 percent of AMI, so they can afford to be there. The resident, we chose a building where the resident manager estimated that 90 older people lived in the building. Um, we don't have real data because apartments don't ask how old their, res their residents are, their tenants are. So that's, it. that's her eyeballing people as they walk down. <laughs> do you look old or do you not look old? <laughs> um, but once we got to that point, in those two years, 70% of the older people participated in this program. And it's a very diverse population. 65% of the par participants are racial or ethnic minorities. And 14 languages are spoken by the program participants. Program accomplishments. 86% of the pr program participants reported that they received helpful information. 60% reported increased physical activity. 80% said that the program increased their desire to remain in their apartments in the complex. And 53 were referred to 173 services. And interestingly, most had never heard of the services to which they were being referred. They knew it a problem, but they didn't know that there might be a solution. The challenges for the program, and you're the perfect audience to share those challenges. Number one, identifying additional locations for which this program would be appropriate, uh, meeting the criteria that were listed earlier. And then the classic one, funding to pay the program coordinator. The residents all pay directly for services, or if they're eligible, the services are free, free if they're free to everybody. We talked to the residents, how much would you be willing to pay to keep this nice young man here with you? And they wanted to keep him here, but paying, that was not inside what they were thinking of. The potential for this program, we think, is still unrealized because if we had, if you're trying to make services affordable, I don't know whether any of you have needed to pay for home care in the last number of years. If you need home care, it's about $18 an hour, and you have to buy it in a block of four hours at a time. 
So you usually need four hours at one time, but that's how you can get it. So in a building like this, if you had four people who needed help, the one person could come and could serve multiple people and get paid for an hour for me, an hour for you, an hour for you. Sometimes they call it a shared aid, but you really have to get it up and going. And the other thing, it's one of those things that is slow to launch, but it really offers great opportunities for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. There's, last year there was a village launched in the neighborhood that I live in, and I'm hoping that when I need it, it'll still be there. So appreciate your oversight of the village. Our next speaker will be Candace Baldwin, and she has nationwide experience with the village model. She is Director of Strategy for Aging and Community for Capital Impact Partners. Welcome, Candace. Thank you all so very much. I'm delighted to be here. and. It's after three o'clock on a Friday, so bear with us all. <laughs> Yay! Um, you know, it's nice to hear the Commission on Aging um, and you all to come together. I was last week. I was with the Maryland Commission on Aging. They did a day-long village uh, training uh, for all their local aging um, Commission on Aging's. Uh, so it was really. Uh, it's feel like I've just kind of went around the region, uh, which is very exciting. So. My name is Candace Baldwin. I am the Director of Strategy for Aging and Community for Capital Impact Partners. Uh, we have been also involved as a partner in the Village to Village Network. How many people here have heard about a village? Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Can you explain it to the person next to you? OK. I got a little work to do. Um, so real quickly, because we do have about uh, 10 minutes to speak, um, and I do want to identify that I did bring some handouts, um, and thank you to the Arlington Neighborhood Villages for living. Um, you have a little bit of their space on our members' table, which is great. Um, and so real quickly, a village is a grassroots organization typically started by older adults in their own community that choose to stay there. And with 89% of, you know, as we heard earlier, 89% of individuals over the age of 65 in Arlington owning their own homes and staying in their own homes, um, I would say you have a great social architecture already in place to really um, launch villages and expand them. Villages consolidate and coordinate services for their members. You pay a membership fee once a year. On average, um, they're $460 for an individual, uh, $800 for a, a family or a household. Um, and what that gets you is really your own self-advocate and an advocate on behalf of you, an instant information and referral source, uh, someone who can, you know, kind of navigate you through the process of aging and planning ahead and supporting your caregiver and looking at all of the things that are needed. But at the same time, villages are really building community. They're building community amongst its members to really support neighbor to neighbor um, opportunities. And so it's interesting that, you know, Terry talks a lot about the services and, and explained a lot of them. And so villages are not out there to uh, replicate or replace what's already in the community, but rather fill the gaps of those services that are already there, because they really are. Um, it's also an asset-based approach. You're really leveraging the really good things that you have in Arlington um, and taking that to the next level. How do we fill in those pieces? How do we make this, this navigation of the aging process and the continuum um, be as smooth and navigable as possible? And so villages do this by through a combination of paid staff and mostly volunteers. They leverage re, uh, relationships with existing community service partners. They also have what's called a, um, a vetted uh, provider network. They will actually look at local organizations, local businesses that provide services. And those are licensed professional services, things that you wouldn't necessarily want to volunteer doing. For instance, home care or um, construction, home modification, home maintenance, plumber, you need someone to fix your technology, um, and all of those kinds of things. Villages can certainly help navigate you to a good provider that's already been background checked, that's references have been checked. This is what you're getting is the value. Plus, also, they may have dis uh, negotiated a discount for that service as well. And 57% of village members actually volunteer back to their village. And I think this is a really important component because it's really about building social engagement and that neighbor helping neighbor. And we talk, you know, when we talked about home care, what is, what is that home care actually coming in to do? And if, if a portion of their time is doing laundry and meal prep and some things that could be done by a volunteer, how do we leverage 
the licensed aspect of that home care to really be directed to that time and wrap around with volunteers that can do the services that are others. And that's what villages can absolutely do. There's a lot of talk about aging and community, um, the age-friendly communities. Villages provide a mechanism. They're one model within a community that actually do that. Currently, there are about 145 villages open and operating across the country. Um, we were started the Village to Village Network in 2010. At that time, there were 48 open villages. We now have 145. We have members in 40 states and four countries. So villages are really resonating with communities around the country. They also build local leadership. They focus on access to health and wellness and social services, um, and really a build about building the social architecture. Some of the things that we talk about that are challenging that might impact sustainability of villages is the fact that it really does require a committed working board. This is not a hand, you know, this is a hands-on board. This is folks that serve on member committees and the volunteers are out there doing the work, raising the money. It is a nonprofit business, so there is, you know, developing business and strategic planning. And these are not skills that most people have, but um, that's why we have the National Village to Village Network and, and 200 and some odd peers across the nation who will certainly help you do that um, as they went through it. And lever leveraging our members and our, our volunteers as resources and really providing strong volunteer training and recognition um, is always good. We've been spent a lot of time, I've been in California for the last three years working on a multi-site evaluation with nine villages there at the University of California, Berkeley. And what we have found is that, you know, we thought, oh, well, we'll just go count a whole bunch of widgets and, and we'll have our evaluation. It'll be great. Because villages are collecting data, right? No. No. So we had to teach people how to do data collection first and then explain to them why that data collection was important and then generate the data, which was really exciting. Um, and some of that data is in a handout of some of the impacts that we found of villages are making. But, you know, it, it, we're, we're really talking about strong nonprofit organizational management and direction and, and that's something that, you know, I think contributes to sustainability of the villages. Um, really leveraging the assets and stakeholders uh, partnerships with you all. Um, villages can come actually work in um, and work with. Vertical villages can help to help them get started. Um, it, and I think when you're talking about affordable, moderate, and low-income housing, especially in multi-unit buildings, it really provides an opportunity to build a, f a strong community amongst the residents in that, in that building. And they're, they're kind of all in it together. And especially when we found villages really responded well during emergency, um, Hurricane Sandy, the villages in New York area were really able to mobilize because they knew who lived alone, they knew who needed oxygen, they know who, you know, they know about their neighbors and they wanted to make sure that those things were accessed. So here in Arlington, um, there are a couple different ways that the villages, we talk about village vertical village, there's a hub and spoke model, there's lots of different business plan or operations being, um, being tested. And so here in Arlington Village, and Carol Paquette, who is one of the founders, is here um, today, so I, I hope I do her justice by explaining the Arlington neighborhood villages. But essentially, the Arlington Neighborhood Village will have a hub, which will be kind of all the back office, the marketing, the, the finance, the stuff that goes into the operations of, and provide the training and support and marketing and member services to the neighborhoods. But we wanted to acknowledge, I think, and Arlington wanted us to do this too, the villages really acknowledge the culture of a neighborhood, that, that you chose to move to this neighborhood because it meant something to you and that's where you raised your children and you have an identity there. And I think that we, we tend to forget that in aging, these are individuals. It's not just a homogenous group over the age of 65. These are individual people who have you know, preferences and desires and choices and, and whatnot. And so um, what I think Arlington Neighborhood Villages is doing great is, is honoring those different kind of pockets in Arlington of, of natural neighborhoods and natural kind of cultural enclaves. And so they're doing that while the, so the hubs, the will also support the spokes. The spokes will be the villages in the neighborhoods out there in and around um, Arlington. And we'll provide the programs, manage the volunteers, do the outreach, all of that. But they'll be supported by the hub. And I think what we're finding is uh, along the national village movement that the hub and spoke model is becoming really prevalent as, as more communities and cities start the village model because it grows out and there's no reason to have competition. It's, it's nice to be able to work in, in economic together. Villages are making impacts. You know, we talk, um, Janet talked earlier about, you know, adding social services, 
being better for transportation, all of these things that really can impact the, the aging process. Um, the villages do at least two of those of her suggestions. So we'll just knock those two right off her bullet list um, from this morning, which was villages all do an awful lot of volunteer transportation. The volunteers are background checked, they are licensed, they are insured drivers, so it's not, you know, come you're just letting your loved one off into the crazy world uh, with someone's car, but really it, it, they do a lot of that. And then say I would say that 60% of the services provided by villages are transportation done by volunteers and it costs them nothing. Um, it's, you know, it's a provided service and so, and it's not just to medical appointments, although that certainly is, is a high prevalent um, need of transportation. But what we're also finding is that uh, villages are meeting the needs of individuals who want to age in place. Um, it's improving their ability to access the services. And, you know, I think you, know, you said it best that 53% of the residents in the vertical village didn't even know that the services were available in their community. And so as much as we, you know, talk to each other and we think that, you know, well, don't you know about villages or don't you know about that service? It, you're still folks that don't know that. And so um, I think the increase of the access and reducing the cost of services because of what you're getting through the village through your, through your membership benefit, most of that is done by volunteers, so you're saving yourself some money. Ad additionally, you're building that social engagement. We found that 73% of people went out of their homes more um, because of their membership in a village. And when you're living alone and you get out of the house, this is, gives you an opportunity to, to be enriched in your life. And it's really about promoting uh, elder um, empowerment too. Aging is a, is a process and it's a constellation of services that need to come together um, but it's also about ensuring that the individual has an engaging and enriched experience through their lives and that they can navigate their process. So we were asked to provide you with some things to think about as housing providers and I would just you know highlight to those of you who may have not seen on September 2nd the uh, Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard released their Housing America's Older Adult re Report little gloom and doom, kind of not new information as far as, yes, the population's getting older and no, we can't house them in their current format. But there were some really good, <laughs> interesting incentives um, that were talked about, um, about talking about some of the universal design offering, you know, that's, and that's really great for new construction, but I think if we talk about the 89% of people who own their own homes outright, they need home modification incentives. They need a process to be able to do that, and whether that's through a tax abatement or with loan programs or partnering with Rebuilding Together or Home Depot or Lowe's. I mean, we, I think cor having corporations come in and play a role in helping support some of the folks to stay in their own home, I think that's obviously behooves them as economically. And then really establish, engaging community residents. I, you know, Terry said it best, you know, if you can get people that come together in a building and they're already there naturally, you know, then there's an opportunity to do that. So um, those are all the information I have today. Um, my information's here. There are some flyers there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later in the program. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. Uh, as I said before, I've been following the village for about a last year, and really, I'm a big advocate for them. And this is the first time I heard about the hub and spoke, so I applaud Arlington County for their leadership. I think that uh, is a way to achieve a lot of efficiencies and more impact in the county. And and I would add to that because you know I think it's a question that we get a lot, um, and and as organizers, I think what. This is an area where partnerships with the local Commission on Aging or county or city offices to help the villages understand the demographic of the people in their neighborhood, do that market assessment, that needs assessment, to really understand who is there and how many people might want to be a part of that village or desire to do that. So, um, you know, I would put that back to you all as partners in the community and stakeholders to see if that's something that you all could share too. These, this is a regular market rate, mixed income, mixed age, apartment building on Columbia Pike. Uh, we were looking for something where people already live with the intent of saying, how do we help people stay there because that's what they want to do and how do we make access to services easier so they don't have to move? That was the whole purpose. So it's a uh, it's a regular independently owned. This particular one happens to be managed by Dittmar. And so they've been the ones who made the space available and their resident manager was wonderfully supportive. Yes. 
Boris, you made a perfect segue for me because we actually used those services, made those referrals, and one of the people who most benefited from this program is a, is a man in his late 40s who we included as part of the program because we didn't have to have, we couldn't count him for some of the things, but he was there. And he's somebody who said that he had lived in that building for 30 years and this was the first time he ever knew any of his neighbors. I mean, it really made a big difference. 